chapter number 19. <coughs> the Gospel of John, chapter number 19. We will use this morning just two verses as our text. As I have mentioned already, we're involved in a seven-part series of words said by men around the cross. Last Sunday we began the series and we looked at the word of the passerby. Those that just walk by. Here is a man and others dying on the cross. And as they walked by, they threw out some words. And those were words of insult. They just had to say something. Let's be reminded that the scene at Calvary, this is a scene of violence. This is a scene that is not pretty. This is a scene where people are put to death. This is a scene where there were people that just could not get by without saying something. <coughs> Today, I direct your attention to Luke, uh, to John's Gospel, Chapter 19 and verse 23. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts, to every soldier a part, and also his coat. Now the coat was without seam, woven from the top throughout. They said therefore among themselves, let us not rend it, but cast lots for it, whose it shall be. That the scripture might be fulfilled, which said, They parted my raiment among them, and for my vesture did they cast lots. These things, therefore, the soldiers did. <coughs> Now here's the Lord Jesus Christ dying on the cross. And the soldiers are, are gambling. They took his garments and made four parts. Four different items of his clothing. And then there was his coat and it was without seam. And they did a lottery. They said among themselves, let's, let's cast lots. Let's gamble. Let's see who might wind up with this beautiful, beautiful coat. Now, notice on the back of your bulletin today, this is the word of insensitivity. Last week we looked at the word of insult. Today we will look at the word of insensitivity. Now what is the significance of these words of these soldiers? Now obviously the Lord wanted it recorded. What they said and what they did. It is here. It is here for a reason. It is here on purpose. There are several things I draw your attention to this morning. You may want to write these things down. The first thing I want to talk about is the Savior. The Savior. Now, under that major heading, you might want to write down this word as well. The simplicity of his dress. Now keep in mind who Jesus really is. He is the God-man. He is, in fact, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. 
And notice the simplicity of his dress. This is the common costume of a poor Galilean. Nothing fancy, nothing spectacular, just simple. Isn't it strange? Here's the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, and yet he is dressed simply like any other poor Galilean. The second thing I draw your attention to is the scarcity of his circumstances. What are the circumstances surrounding the person of the Lord Jesus Christ? At this point in his life, and at all points in his life, he had no house. He had no money. He had no land. If you would look at his balance sheet, it didn't look good. He didn't have what you and I commonly have. He did not have a statement that said, here is his net worth. Of course, with the person of Christ, he is worth everything. But if you looked at his particular circumstances, he didn't have anything. He didn't have a retirement account. He had no house. He had no money. He had no land. But thirdly, look at the submissiveness of his spirit. Here is the Lord Jesus Christ, and he is dying. And he never utters one word of complaint. None whatsoever. He does not complain about his circumstances. He is dying. He is being executed. And he says nothing. Now let's direct our attention secondly to the soldiers. There are some things I want to bring to your attention. Number one is their inhumanity. Their inhumanity. Jesus isn't even dead yet. They have just placed him there on the cross. And it meant nothing to them. It didn't bother them at all. They were simply doing their job. They had done this before. Many, many times. Many times they had taken a victim. And they, they just simply followed orders. And said, well, you know, he is to be crucified. And it takes a very cold individual, I believe, to actually crucify another person. They are the ones who would have taken his body and thrown him onto the cross. They were the ones who would have taken the spikes and driven them through his hand. They were the ones who would have crossed one leg over the other and drove a spike through his feet. They were the ones who would have taken that cross and lifted it up and dropped it into a hole. They were the ones who would have seen this over and over and over again. How victim after victim after victim would have been crucified. And even though this was Jesus, to them it made no difference whatsoever. They had got to the point where they were doing things that were inhuman. Secondly, notice today they're insensitive. Insensitive. Jesus could have looked down from the cross and probably did. And they divided his garments. He wasn't even dead. They gambled and cast lots over his coat. How insensitive to not even wait, but just to go ahead and do it. 
before he was dead. And thirdly, look at the instrumentality. Now, even though these were wicked men, even though these were inhumane men, even though these were soldiers who were simply doing their job, God used them to bring prophecy to pass. Notice again in verse 34, they said therefore among themselves, let us not rend it, but cast lots for it, whose it shall be. Now watch this, that the scripture might be fulfilled, which said, they parted my raiment among them, and for my vesture they did cast lots. These things therefore the soldiers did. They didn't even realize that God was fulfilling prophecy through their own actions. God was fulfilling prophecy through these soldiers. They were the instruments of God to bring things to pass exactly as had been promised. So we looked at the Savior, we looked at the soldiers. Now, thirdly, let's look at the suffering. The suffering. Now, notice in verse 30, 24, it talks about the fulfillment of prophecy. That is our first sub-point there, the fulfillment of prophecy. Look at verse 24, uh, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Look at verse 28. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Drop down to verse number 36. For these things were done, that the scripture should be fulfilled. A bone of him shall not be broken. Where did all of this come from? The fulfillment of what scripture? Turn with me back to the Old Testament to the book of Psalms. Let's go to Psalm 22. Now keep in mind, this would have been written. This is a Psalm of David. This would have been written a thousand years before the time of Christ. This was an old prophecy. This had been around for a long time. And it was even as though God said through David, I'm going to give you a glimpse of what the cross would actually be like. Now in Psalm 22, look at verse 1. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? These are the words of the Lord Jesus a thousand years later. Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? Oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but thou hearest not. Now follow with me to verse number 13. And here is a direct prophecy. This is the prophecy that is fulfilled when Jesus is on the cross. Look at verse 13. They gaped upon me with their mouths as a ravening and a roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. I want to stop right there. Notice that one phrase in verse 14. All my bones are out of joint. Can you just begin to imagine the intensity of the cross? Can we just begin to understand the tremendous pain and suffering of the sea. Now verse 15. My strength is dried up like a potsherd. My tongue cleaveth to my jaws. And thou hast brought me into the dust of death. For dogs have come past me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierce my hands and my feet. 
I may tell all my bones. They, they look and stare upon me. They part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. I'm sure that even now as I'm speaking or at other points in your life, when you, have when you have thought about the sufferings of Christ, your mind has gone and taken this thought and this scripture and brought them all together. My friends, there is no way for us to fully understand the intensity of the suffering of our Savior. What put it there? What Put him there. My sin. My sin. <clears throat> you might say, but Pastor, it was mine too. All right? That's fine. But I want you to think in that. What have you done? Who are you? What is your sin? And your sin and my sin is what nailed him and the punishment for that sin he bore in his body on the cross. The suffering is a fulfillment of prophecy. Number two, it is the failure of protocol. The failure of protocol. By that, I mean to say there is no decency. There is no evidence. Why not give the clothing to his friends? Why not give the clothing to his family? No, that's not the point. There was no decency. There was no evidence. There was no one who said, well, you know, quite frankly, we ought to find some of his family and give them this cloak. Oh, no, 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 no. There's no protocol. It's the failure of protocol. It is human nature, my friends, to take. That is human nature. I see that I have the opportunity to take this. So I do. It's called theft. It's called stealing. And yet, it is human nature. It is the degree of the fallenness of humanity and the depths of depravity. Number three is the forfeiture of propriety. The forfeiture of propriety. Propriety would be being proper, correct behavior, morals, and suitable actions. And that was forfeited completely by these soldiers. What is the conclusion? It is insensitivity. Insensitivity. Now, will you notice with me that these men never got the picture. They never got it. Why? <laughs> Why didn't they get it? Why didn't they understand it? Why didn't they see that this man is different? Oh, they had heard the reports. They had known a little bit about this guy. They were the ones who probably said among themselves, well, we're going to crucify this big shot. Oh yeah, this, this upstart, this preacher, this revolutionary, whatever you want to call him. Well, he's nothing now, and we'll just crucify him just like we do every other victim. Insensitivity. Business as usual. Do you realize when Christ was crucified? Commerce went on as usual. 
The day that Jesus died, all the markets were open and things went on as usual. We've seen in our text here, the gambling went on as usual. They're going to cast lots. The clothing had value. That's why they took it. That's usual. But of the person of Christ, there is no value. And that, my friends, is as usual as well. Now, we're going to, throughout this series, we've talked about the word of the passerby, those that walked by and said, Aha! Oh yeah! You're the same guy that said you were going to have a kingdom, and now look, you're dying. Today we're looking at the soldiers, the word of insensitivity, and the people that say, this means nothing at all to me whatsoever. I want to gamble over his clothing. Next Sunday we'll talk about those who were the bystanders. Not those who walked by, but those who stood there and watched. And then we'll talk about the centurion who said, surely this was the Son of God. We'll talk about Pilate, the governor, and his inadequate word who said, I, I, I wash my hands of this man. And then the Sunday right before Resurrection Day, also known as Easter, we'll talk for a moment about the man who was the repentant thief crucified next to Jesus who said, Remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. If you had been there, who would you be? You might say, Well, I, I might be one of those that just passes by. I may not be one of the soldiers. I may be one of the people that watches. I may be like the centurion who says, surely this is the Son of God. I want you to think with me. How does a person get to the point where they acknowledge who that person dying on the cross really is. How did you get to that point? How did I get to that point? How does anyone get to that point? Is it because of intuition? Well, I simply have a hunch that this is the Son of God. Is it because of intelligence? Oh, we'd like to think that it is. We'd like to think, oh yes, you know, I know a good deal when I see it, and Jesus dying in my cross, on the, uh, on the cross in my place. I can intellectualize, I can process that. I can, I can intellectualize that and I can draw conclusions because of that. Is that the answer? Or is it a matter of illumination? My friends, I don't think for a moment it has anything to do with intuition. I don't think for a moment it has anything to do with intelligence. I think it has everything to do with the fact that God by His Spirit has illuminated our heart and our mind and we see who Jesus really is. So it's not based on something found within us. It is rather something that is given to us and something that we are blessed with. Amen. 
As we began our service, I mentioned that we sing holy, 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 and it's all about God. May I remind you in Isaiah chapter 6 when Isaiah, and he said, uh, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. And then he talks about the angels and how magnificent they were. And the angels cried one to another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And you find that it's all about God. The scene in heaven is all about God. And then when Isaiah saw that, he became unglued. He said, I am undone. He completely unrattled. The glue that held him together, everything melted. And he became almost as a dead man. And that's what happens in the presence of God. You and I get to the point where we have very little input other than the praise of the Almighty. My friends, we should get to the point in our lives where we realize that we are, we are recipients of the work of grace. Did I intellectualize myself to believe? Did I just have a hunch and follow that hunch? Or did I believe because God, by His mercy and His grace, illuminated my heart and mind to embrace the person of Jesus Christ? You say, Pastor, why is that so important? Because what you believe about that will help to determine a lot of other things that you believe and how you practice what you believe. Makes all the difference in the world. I was a part of a conversation one time with several preachers and we began to talk about the nature of God. And one of my preacher friends said to one of the others, he said, you know, I figured out your problem. And he said, oh, good. The other fellow said, oh, that's good. Man, I want to get right to the heart of this. I need to know what is my problem. And he looked at him and said, your God is too small. My friends, we have a big God, a God who's capable of anything, a God who's capable of everything, and he has a plan, and he's working that plan, and it's not ours to say, well, I'm going to do this or I'm going to do that. It is ours to say, God, you made me part of that plan. Thank you. I will follow and obey what you want. The soldiers, the word of insensitivity. Is it any different today, really? Are there people today, if we were crucifying people, would there be soldiers who would say, oh, I'll do that, I've done it before. If crucifixion was part of the modern day, and Jesus returned, would there be people who would be so insensitive to say business as usual? I saw something the other day that shocked me. It was a picture of someone with a placard in a protest, protest march somewhere, and they were holding a placard that says, if Jesus comes again, we'll kill him again. Oh, 
They did it then. And they'll do it even today. You say, but I wouldn't do that. I love Jesus. I, I understand that he loved me and, and gave himself for me. And, 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 and I would never, I would never, I would stand for him. I would believe in him. I would give my, my life for him if necessary. And my friends, praise God. Praise God that we're not one of those, but by grace and by grace only, we are one of those who says, Jesus is my Savior, and I love him, Amen. and I'll stand by him, because I know he will stand by me. One of the things that we do in homiletics, study of sermonizing, delivering sermons, one of the things that we study is what, what we want out of this. What we want out of this. And my friends, what I want for you today, and probably already taking place, but that is that you and I might have an even deeper appreciation for Jesus and how he suffered for you and I. One more thing before I close. Do you even know Jesus? No, I, I didn't say you know about him. I said, do you know him here in your heart? Not just intellectualizing, not just a hunch, but do you have an intimate relationship with Jesus, is he in fact your Savior from sin? There might be someone here today, it might be you, and you're thinking, that's what I want. Well, my friends, that's what we want for you. More importantly, that's what God wants for you. As we conclude our service, we have people that deacons in our, in our conference room that will sit at a table with you and they will express to you what God has done in their life and what God is wanting to do in your life. If I were you, I'd take a minute, I'd visit with them and find out what God has for you today. Father in heaven, thank you for Calvary. Thank you for our Savior. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you, Father, that you have revealed yourself to us. Make us ever grateful for the work of grace. Father, bless these thoughts to our hearts, we pray in Jesus' name.